Well, let's begin our study, shall we? I'd like to begin with a story. A man found a magical bottle and picked it up and rubbed it, and lo and behold, a genie came forth. And the genie said, Behold, I give you one wish. Whatever you desire, as long as it is within the realm of possibility. And that man said, It's perfect. I know exactly what I want. Genie, I wish for a unicorn. And the genie says, nope, sorry, can't do that. I can't make something that doesn't exist. Impossible. You have to wish for something else. And the man thought for a moment. And he said, all right then, genie. I wish you would give me the ability to understand my wife. And the genie looked at him and said, all right then. What color do you want your unicorn? This silly little joke, gives us an illustration of a pretty common feeling amongst, uh, amongst men and amongst husbands, and that is that it is difficult for under, us to understand our wives. In fact, for men to understand women, and probably women to understand men as well, although maybe to some differing degree. But the reality is that we're different. Men and women have very obvious differences and distinctions, and as much as the foolishness of our world tries to erase or destroy or ignore those, it comes out as plain and as obvious as day that there are just core differences between men and women, between masculinity and femininity, and that causes situations, both situations wonderful, as God had intended and designed, and situations that are difficult because of the influence of sin in our lives. But last week, we got to look at the tremendous gift and uh, high office given to women in the marriage relationship. And I hope you noticed that uh, women were really only being called, wives specifically, called to be in this relationship with their husbands, right? This wasn't about men and women in general. This is about an individual husband and an individual wife and how they're meant to relate. And essentially, Peter described to them a subset of general Christian growth. So I want to remind you again, that the Bible is not really giving tons of different messages. Just turn to the wives section, just turn to the husbands section. What's really going on is the Bible is giving us information that every Christian, every human, right, needs to know, learn, trust in, and grow in. And then when we get into the specific, like, oh, by the way, you know, someone stands up and says, well, what about us husbands? Well, what about us wives? The message doesn't change. It's still grow in Christ, grow spiritually, learn to love and serve one another with the kind of uh, love and life that Christ supplies you, right? And then the, the result will be, well, in this situation, it'll look like this. In this situation, it'll look like that. But don't ever confuse the specific outplay or the specific explanations in Scripture as differing from the larger whole commandment and desire for us to be grown in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, abide in Christ, and be grown and conformed to His image by His power and by His Spirit. That's the point, right? So today's message, as we mentioned, is directed at husbands. And so that leaves a question, is that only some of us watching this will be husbands. Many will not be husbands. And so you might say, well, if I'm not a husband, should I just check out? And the answer is no. You should not just check out. If you are a young girl, if you're an unmarried woman, then you might be at some point looking for a godly husband, which means you need to know what a godly husband looks like. This world has terrible, terrible pictures of what masculinity is meant to look like. It has pictures of uh, weak and effeminate, demurring, pathetic, surrendering masculinity put forth on one side, and then it has abusive, angry, violent, dominating masculinity on the others. Neither, Neither is a picture, though they are culturally accepted as men, whether it's, again, the brawny man or the... uh, limp-wristed metrosexual who's walking around in, you know, the big cities of today, both exist in the world, and the world will, at least certain portions of the world, will say that that's masculinity, or that's what masculinity should look like, and they're both wrong, along with a host of others. What is right 
is what God says that a husband and a man and masculinity should look like, what the life of Christ looks like. So if you're a young lady and you're thinking about uh, evaluating someone as to whether or not they're the kind of husband, the kind of man that you want to attach yourself to and support and love and, and be connected to for the rest of your earthly life, you better know what you're looking for. You better know, and you better not allow uh, this world or your, or your flesh or your own, even what you've seen in your own household necessarily, don't let that affect what God wants you to look for in order to find the type of person, the type of man who's really going to love you and serve you and build you up to be the godly woman, the most godly woman you can be. So girls, this is a message for you. Because you're looking for this character, this dedication, this a man with these goals, not the others. Uh, next, everyone. Yep, went from something very specific to something very general. Absolutely every single person, whether you're a husband or not, needs to and will need to uh, counsel or encourage a husband in biblical living. As a non-husband, <laughs> you will have husband friends this is whether you're male or female you have husband friends and part of your job as their their brother or sister in christ is to encourage them to live up to what the bible has to say about what christian husband ship looks like so everyone has a reason to listen to that in that it prepares you and equips you to help encourage the husbands in your life to be the husbands they're meant to be wives you want to know what's expected from your husband, right? Now, there's two wrong way, there's a wrong way to take this too, wives. You can take this and go, well, he's not living it up to living up to it and then use that against him, weaponize this information against him. Don't be that wife. Rather than that, be the type of wife who sees this standard of godly husband uh, husbanding. <laughs> I've got to find a better word. Husbandry's taken. That doesn't, that doesn't mean it. So anyway, uh, being a godly husband so that you can support him and encourage him to become that kind of husband, which is simultaneously a godly man. In other words, last week, just as we saw that the wives are supporting their husbands so that they become can become the most godly men that they can be. So you need to know what that looks like, right? Because we have, again, bad cultural ideas of what godliness looks like bad cultural ideas of what holiness looks like, bad cultural ideas of what righteousness looks like, and certainly we have terrible cultural ideas of what a husband should be. In fact, if you want to know what a husband is, turn off your TV for the rest of your life, because I can't think of a single truly great example in film or television of what husband, uh, of what being a husband should be, not one that compares to Christ. And yet those things are making images, making um, ideals in our mind, whether we choose to accept them or think about ourselves as accepting them or not. That is uh, a reality. So, young men, this message is for you because you will or may, I should say, if God is gracious in, to you and blesses you in the way of giving you uh, a marriage to be a part of, but uh, young men, you may one day be a husband, and you need to know what you're signing up for if you want to be a godly husband. You need to know what that looks like. You need to have that picture, that image in your mind of this is where we're heading, a husband who acts like this, a husband who behaves like this, a husband who treats his wife in this way. You need to know this. Even if you're not married yet, if you think you might be someday, you should have this uh, very well in mind. Next and finally, husbands. This is important. Don't ever think that we've got this wired for sound, right? It's so easy to go uh, to fall into that sort of sad, masculine, sinful laziness and go, yep, I guess the marriage is pretty good. No one's squawking. That's not the ideal. The biblical ideal for marriage is not nobody's squawking. The biblical ideal for marriage is far greater, as we'll see. So husbands don't um, complacently sit in this message and think, yep, I'm probably doing okay. Like, I give myself a 70%. That's not, how this, that's not how this game is played. As you're relying on Christ, as Christ's life comes forth from you, for you, it'll be an ever-growing, ever-exceeding uh, sense of his love poured out into your marriage. So, husbands are the goal. Everyone is the audience. Husbands are the focal point, but everyone has something to learn uh, from this message with one more bonus uh, application that you'll have um, at the end. So, it starts. Husbands, likewise, 
homois, is it in the same way or in the same manner? So the Greek word here, homo means same, ois. Here the idea is same, uh, in this sense being same or manner, or manner or way. So he's just spent six verses talking about wives and what is expected of wives. And then when he starts with husbands, he immediately uses this wonderful word, likewise, in the same way. In other words, he's not drawing a distinction in how, a huge distinction in how husbands and acts husbands should act and how wives should act. There's a lot of overflow and overlap. There's a lot of similarity because that is the character of Christ. And for the most part, the character of Christ is going to look very, very similar when coming out through one type of person in one situation and another type of person in another situation. Why? Because it's the character of Christ. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. His character, his love, his life is going to be uh, similarly detectable, whether it's talking about what it means to live as a Christian employee or live as a Christian boss or live as a Christian um, husband or wife or child. There's going to be that essence, that, that, that similarity of, of, that is of note, right? So it makes sense that Peter says, likewise, not husbands, and he could have used a strong conjunction like, but Allah in the Greek. He could have said, but husbands, something totally different. But instead he's saying, likewise, there's a lot of similarity here. So wives are given the same basic directive. So if we want to put out how this likewise plays out, at least in my mind, wives, your goal, as we saw, is to glorify God and support your husband so that he can grow spiritually. Husbands, your goal is to glorify God and support your wife in her spiritual growth so that she can become the most godly woman. There will be some differing expressions of that because of the differences between men and women. We'll go into that. But the basic goal is identical. You're going to try to support your spouse so that they can achieve the ultimate goal of human life of glorifying God and growing in maturity in Him. That's it. If you want a goal for your wife or your husband, that's the goal. You want to see them grow to be more like Jesus. Simple, direct, and clear. And that's what Peter's starting with here. Next, he says, dwell with them. Now, it's a single word combining the word together and the word for home, oikos. So um, these two words, when put together, it's, it's homing, to, you might say homing together or making a home together. You say dwell is a great word. It is, but I want to note that that word home is in there. There's, a, there's other words like meno that can mean abide and can mean dwell and stay together in a different sense. But this word has, a, has the, the home in the picture, right? And a, a home is not a house. A home is the, the place that you dwell together. Now, I want to point this out that husbands are meant to live with their wives, Boyfriends are not meant to live with their girlfriends. Husbands are meant to live with their wives. It's a very special and unique uh, privilege that the Bible gives to two people who are joined in holy matrimony or committed to one another before the Lord in their marriage, right? So this flies in the face of all of the garbage that this world puts forth. And we want to note that it is always the women who suffer most from cohabitation. It's the women who suffer the most of, uh, for potential abuses, for manipulation of all kinds. It's the women who suffer most the psychological uh, effects of not being able to trust her, her husband, right? Because if she could tempt him to uh, come together and, and live with her because of sexual desire, then someone else could, especially if they were prettier, right? You know that she could, you know, get his attention that way, but doesn't that mean that someone else could steal his attention that way? Whereas if we live in a truly biblical manner and the, uh, the, the boyfriend, the suitor, the would-be uh, bridegroom is demonstrating that my interest in you as a future wife is an interest that is not based on what pleasure you can provide me or whether you'll be advantageous, but it's based in my God-given desire to love you with the love that Christ loves the church, to build you up and to support you, to be faithful and dedicated to you in all things, right? Who pays when we break that God-given pattern? The wife does. 
She's the one who is vulnerable. She's the one who will feel depression. She is the one who will suffer with doubt and fear uh, against her husband's clear failures of character that led up to their union. So, point one, husbands live with wives, not anyone else. Husbands live with their wives. That's the biblical order. And it says, uh, we want to point out what else this is, and that is, it's easy for a husband not to be at home, right? Work, hobbies, friends, passions. There's, it's so much more fun, or it might seem so much more fun at a certain point to be on the golf course all weekend. It might seem more fun to be out camping or hunting or fishing all weekend. It might seem like there's a greater sense of productivity if we just spend all day at work or all week at work and never come home because the relationships and the, the chemistry at home is di more difficult for us to manage and understand and feel like we've got a sense of production. This is important. Husbands, be at home. Be at home, husbands. It's not that it's wrong to go out with your friends now and again and have fellowship. It's certainly not. It's not that it's wrong to go on an occasional hunting trip or fishing trip or whatever. But you, when you entered into this marriage relationship, you put someone else's needs before your own. And that means being present with her. Many men can have the false idea that being a good husband is just not doing any harm. What? I don't say anything mean. I never hit. I never do. I'm never vile. I never raise my voice. I'm just, yeah, you're never there. That's not being a good husband, just not doing any harm to the situation. Presence. Being a godly Christ-like husband demands presence. Be there with her, engaged with her. As we're going to talk about, and I imagine we'll get to talk about in our uh, marriage and singleness con uh, conference that is upcoming, we'll see that the gift of being single is that you can dedicate all your time to serving the Lord and all your time to doing what, what it is that will you know, help build you up, grow you towards Christ. You can be, that in, in a sense, self-centered in that way. You're directing your time. But if you're married, your time and your attention and your presence is first belongs with your wife, engaged with her, and in, in connected to her, and yeah, involved with her. That doesn't sound, that might not sound like it's first on our list particularly the way that the Lord made men, many of us would far rather sit in silence or go do something constructive than go about the rather messy and difficult work, sometimes difficult work, of wading through someone else's thoughts, experiences, emotions, and desires. But it's what you're called to do. Dwell with her. Be at home with her. Not always, not your only job, you drive each other nuts. But make sure you're making time, dedicate time to be together. Engage with her. Next, we have this picture of him with understanding. Dwell with understanding. Now, I gave that little joke up front on purpose for this exact point. Is that the idea of understanding a woman is, is really uh, sounds an unsurmountable goal to us. And rightly so, because again, we might fall into the mistake of thinking that this means fully understanding, I've got her all figured out, I've got her wired for sound, she never surprises me. Not the picture. Actually, the word here is gnosis, which is the, the word for knowledge. And really, not just any kind of knowledge, not book knowledge, but actually understanding in a good, uh, good way, an intimate knowledge. In other words, as at the illustration that I've used time and time again is that you can read a book or watch a YouTube video on changing the oil in your car and theoretically know how to do it. But as we all know, once you get the hood up on your car and start looking at all those parts and pieces and how they're slightly different from what's on, and once we really feel what it's like to turn those you know, turn those screws and knobs and all that business, we realize that there's a difference between knowing about something and really being able to do it. But more so than that, you could meet a, a lube tech at a car dealership or at, a, at an auto mechanic who, who changes the oil on hundreds of cars possibly a day, and he really knows, right? He could do it with his eyes closed. He could do it in his sleep. Um, so 
the point that we want to uh, to make here is that the Christian husband is meant to have an ever-growing, ever-deepening knowledge of his wife. And in your lifetime, you will never get to the end. Just as we're meant to have an ever-growing, ever-deepening knowledge of the Lord, right? First and foremost, our primary relationship in this world. Uh, and, and we'll never get to the end of him in all of the ages of eternity to come. So we're meant to pursue our wives in that same way, growing to know them, to understand them. In fact, like I bring my wife to annoyance, constantly asking her why she does that. Do you like that? Oh, wow. I didn't know that you really, did you, is that a new thing or did you, right? Constantly uh, wanting to know them and know about them more. And I want to note, we gave, last week we gave uh, women a list of things that were not effective ways, you know, to, to, uh, to get your husband to change and come to a more godly place. Men, here's another, here's a list for us. These are not good ways to try to think that we understand our wives. First of all, no gaslighting. You familiar with gaslighting? Gaslighting is when you claim that the other person is crazy, right? So you come up to a point of disagreement and, it, oh, you're just crazy. Or, oh, it's just that time of the month. Oh, it's just, and it's a dismissive, uh, a dismissive attitude towards what the other person is saying or the complaint or thought that the other person has on the basis that they're mentally unfit in some way. That is abhorrent. It is the least respectful, most awful, horrifying way that we can treat another human being in the context of marriage, and it's not acceptable. You might be able to bully her in that way from sharing her uh, thought or get out of a sense of disagreement, but you will not complete God's goal of a truly uh, Christ-like marriage. Next, no ignoring. This was on both lists, by the way. No ignoring. Just ignoring your wife and the problems and the issues that she's having is not ever going to get anywhere, right? Now, I'm not saying that there might be sit, not be situations on both sides where you uh, give that person time to sort things out on their own or think about it, but make sure that you know that they know that that's what's going on, that you're not trying to ignore their complaint. You're trying to give them space to cool down and come to a better, you know, thinking on the subject or whatever it is. Ignoring the problem won't make it go away, men ever, ever. The worst or the best it'll do, sorry, is bury that problem so that it uh, doesn't come to light. Next, no dominating, no shouting, no physically intimidating or threatening to uh, either leave and walk away from the marriage or somehow uh, be insistent upon dominating or winning. As we see, the nature of Christian leadership is always service. And we have a dreadful idea from our culture and from our world as to what leadership and what power are all about. But true leadership and true power in a relationship is used to serve and upbuild the best for the best the ones served, right? That's the idea of, of any system of government, any, any governance, any leadership in a, in a company. The whole point is that the upper echelons would exist to make life better for those in the so, so-called lower echelons or those whom they are serving, right? That is Christ's view of leadership, and he was the prime example of that. So, men, simple. No gaslighting, no ignoring, no dominating, no shouting, no uh, threatening to leave or threatening of, uh, of violence of any kind, emotional or physical. That never works. That is always a high-grade failure of a husband. However, that leads us to the next question, the positive question. If those aren't ways to understand, then how do we understand women? Well, how did you get into your favorite sport? How did you come to understand your favorite sport or hobby or your work, right? Well, first you watched. You watched someone else do it. You watched and, and, and observed how it was done that brought you into that uh, situation, right? Um, and so that's the first exhortation I'd give you. If you're going to understand your wife, you have to observe her. Did you ever watch The Crocodile Hunter? I always loved that show. I've always thought that it would be really funny to wake up in a full khaki outfit and say, Behold, the beautiful woman wakes in the, in the early hours of the morning to feed the children and get ready for the school day. And now, oh, watch, now she's going to go, oh, my. 
walk through the whole day and narrate it like that, I could see that. I could do that. That would be fun. I would get in trouble. I would get slapped, especially if I had a video camera. Yeah, that would be inappropriate. But nevertheless, observe your wife. Pay attention to her. Watch what she's doing. Watch what she doesn't do. Watch what she loves. Not to criticize it or correct it, but just to observe what she's about, right? If you're going to live with her with understanding, if you're going to have a full knowledge of her as the scripture uh, commands and demands of you, then you must have an observational basis on which to, to know her. So watch her. So pay attention to her. Don't just grunt if, as, uh, you know, grunt as you pass each other in the hallway. But actually, uh, watch and pay attention to what's going on, how she's feeling, how she's thinking, how she shows those feelings, how she uh, needs to deal with those, when she needs space and when she needs, and so on. Watch her. Next, listen. This might be most difficult. I heard a joke of a husband and a wife lying in bed, and he said, honey, I can't get to sleep. Can you talk for a while so I can fall asleep? <laughs> it's a terrible joke. But the reality is, is that it's very easy for men to kind of shut down when information's coming in at us, either, you know, because we don't understand it or we don't understand the relevance uh, that it plays to us. And because we're basically selfish beings, we're going, just, can you wake me up when you're going to tell me something that concerns me? Because otherwise, I'm not that interested. Become interested. Listen to what she's saying. Listen to what she's sharing. It does affect you. Because it affects her. You follow that? It personally and directly affects you because it personally and directly affects her. Savvy? This is a big deal. Watch, observe, listen. And thirdly, ask questions. Especially when you see her doing something you don't understand. Not questions like, why are you doing that? Or, what's that all about? But question, or, why are you wearing those? No. <laughs> Not those kinds of questions, but genuine questions of, is everything okay? What's going on? Did I, did something go wrong or why do you do that? Is that your favorite? Is that something you like? You can ask questions and get someone talking about themselves in any situation. It lets them know that you care about them and it gives you the ability to build more information of how to live with her in an understanding way. All right, so dwelling with her, Husbands and wives only, dwelling together with understanding. Next, we see uh, the, 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 the next little participle here. Again, Peter's still using his participles. Giving honor. Now, this idea of giving honor to the wife, this is tough. In our flesh, we think, I'm in charge because I'm the best, and I get all the honors and glory and praise. And that's a human, fleshly, carnal way of thinking, Right? So we try to seize control and think that we'll have honor by running the other person down. Um, not just men, men, women, and everyone. We think that uh, we're insecure in our, our position of leadership, and so we think that by running everyone else down and showing that they're not as good as us, that's why I'm in charge, because I'm the best one, I'm the smartest one, I'm the strongest one. Uh, and then if they ever thought so, then, whew, then, they, then, I wouldn't be, then I wouldn't be valuable anymore, right? Um, or little jabs, patronizing, a patronizing attitude. Oh, yeah, you think that because you just don't know you're not as smart as me, right? Um, that's tough. We don't understand that it is the job, it is the duty of the one who is leading in the relationship to constantly be giving honor to, every, or to the, the wife, right? Now think about that concept. If you have a party and you're going to have a guest of honor, the guest of honor is the focal point of that party, right? So if you're having a, a party for, uh, you know, for your wife or for a friend, what are you going to do? You're going to gather around the things that they, the people that they love, the things that they love, maybe the foods that they love. Everything in the party will be pointed to them so that they can understand that they're honored and loved, whether that's for a graduation or for, you know, some sort of uh, professional uh, accomplishment or just for the wonders and beauty of having, say, a celebrating a birthday or, or a marriage anniversary, whatever. The point is, is that the guest of honor, everything should be, is directed at them. So is your wife the guest of honor in your life? Is, the, is your wife the guest of honor or is she just kind of another coworker? right? Most marriages on this earth seem to me to exist as sort of sad business relationships that just kind of keep going on. 
That's not how marriage was designed to be by the Lord. Marriage is a place of extreme joy, comfort, and upbuilding between two individuals as they're built around Christ. Husbands, that means that in the house that is your life, your wife is the guest of honor. Do you seek to recognize her for her intelligence, her support, her strength, her hard work? Do you seek to honor her for those things before your children and before others? Do you seek to lift her up with your words or do you playfully and joke, jokingly tear her down and, and drag out her dirty laundry in front of others? The choice is yours, but scripture leaves you no choice. Your job is to honor her. As the weaker vessel, oh, now we've got controversy, right? Everybody's, oh, half the people in the world just got mad and they didn't know why. And that's because, well, never mind why it is. So there's some possibilities. This is a, definitely a challenging or even maybe a surprising chapter, uh, verse. There's impossibilities on what this might mean. First of all, some people have suggested that Peter means that they have lesser physical strength. And that could be demonstrated, right? Like on the whole, the large, largely, by and large, men are physically stronger than women, physically less susceptible to, you know, certain types of violence and, and physical attack. That's a possibility. Um, next, uh, some have suggested that this is just in regards to their political or social position, particularly in Greek and Roman culture, uh, probably less so in the Jewish culture, but, but, but particularly in the G Greek and Roman culture, there was not a lot of freedom for many women. There was not a lot of freedoms, and they were, uh, they were in a great amount of trouble if they didn't have uh, a man to uh, represent them in their business dealings and their life and their health and, and the like. And so that meant that the wife or the husband had a naturally socially built in power trump card and that if they were to break up or divorce, she would be ruined and he would be fine, right? So um, suggesting that she has a, a vulnerability, a political social vulnerability uh, is possibly the case. And there's another, po again, we could probably run down nine or ten of these. Another possibility, her special vulnerabilities as a woman. She has unique biological vulnerabilities, right, with having to do with um, the, the cycle that enables her to have children. When she is pregnant, she is especially physically and emotionally vulnerable, as we know. Uh, she has special uh, hormonal vulnerabilities, things that affect a woman hormonally that don't affect a man, that make her more uh, vulnerable, make life more challenging or more difficult for her after a fashion. And uh, finally, connection to the family. It is, again, in general terms, frequently more difficult for a mother to distance herself emotionally from the idea of her kids, whereas uh, husbands have a tendency to go, no, it looks like an adult now. Have fun. <laughs> of course, that's not true across the board, but there is a closer emotional attachment. There's emotional vulnerability that God built into women because we need that. We need that as humanity. We need that in order to come to a full expression and understanding of what God's love is like and what God's life is like, right? And Paul uses in um, Thessalonians the image of both father love and mother love, and you have to have both of those uh, expressions of love to come to a greater understanding of the nature and character of God's type of love. So, I think uh, I certainly favor the third of this, that the uh, husband is meant to dwell with her with understanding because she has vulnerabilities in so many ways that, don't, uh, that you don't have. So you need to bridge the gap and understand her. You need to bridge the gap and understand what these uh, threats, vulnerabilities, and fears that might uh, threaten her or might challenge her uh, are, and you need to deal with helping her and addressing those and letting her know that you're with her to, to deal with those. So we have be present with her with understanding, give her honor and know that she has different vulnerabilities than you do. And then we ask, well, why? He says, as being uh, heirs together in the grace of life. Did you catch it? You are co-heirs in the grace of life. She is saved by the same blood of Jesus Christ that you are saved. By, or by which you are saved. She is the same spiritual inheritance that you do. 
with no exception. She has the same uh, uh, appointment to stand before Jesus Christ, the Son of God, on her own two feet. She has everything on the spiritual realm that you have. She has the same capacity uh, for growth. She has the same opportunity to become spiritually mature. She has the same opportunity to learn and know Bible doctrine and Bible teaching. She has the same potentiality to, uh, to reflect and show the love of Christ, to do the work of an evangelist, to teach and build up the body of Christ. She has the same opportunity that you do. Different expressions, different focuses, different offices, different place, but ultimately there is no distinction in terms of her ability to grow in Christ and have an honored position before Christ, even if you serve different functions in the family and functions while you're on planet Earth and different functions in the church, because we need all those functions. Galatians 3.28 tells us, For there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Paul was clearly not and never trying to do away with the distinctions between masculinity and femininity and male and female in this life. He was trying to point out that in the most important realm possible, that we are completely united in Jesus Christ and we stand on equal footing before him. And that is the basis for us to understand how we go about our different roles and uh, situations and attitudes and things that we would go about in a day, our day-to-day -day lives, right? Because there are differences. There's differences in biology, right? They have the, two people, a man and a woman, have the same uh, potential for a spiritual position before Christ and for growth in their condition, but there are huge differences in how they're going to go about it and how they're going to be affected. The differences in their biology are going to be an enormous effect on how they go about how they live their lives. There are a massive difference between male and female neurobiology. All this absolute nonsense about a male body with a female brain, someone who got a, a male brain or a female brain in the wrong body is ridiculous. We can test this, we can see it, we can observe it, and it's garbage. It's self-deception to even suggest otherwise. There are differences between the way that men and women think, the way that men and uh, women communicate, and the way that men and women act, and that's a great thing. Rather than trying to uh, plan it all out and say there's no difference and losing the benefits of both, we meant to embrace and enjoy the great difference. Next, we have different abilities. Men and women are cri both critically and valuable, vital to the forward movement of society for success as a, as a species and as a world. And if we're not uh, honoring both uh, sides of that, then, and understanding the differences, and again, as modern feminism does, demanding that women act like men, then we're going to fall apart. We lose femininity in feminism, and that is the greatest loss humanity could ever sustain. We can't sustain it. We'll crumble for it. Just as if we lost masculinity, as is trying to happen on the other side. <clears throat> However, there's no difference... So there's all these differences, but there's no difference in the need for salvation. There's no difference in the potential for spiritual maturity and to honor Christ. There's no difference in their need to know the Bible or the amount of Bible that they could learn, right? I was so, one of the things that was so special about Jesus' ministry is that he taught women. Other rabbis of the day, not all of them, but many of them, would say that it was a waste of time. You should never teach your women, you know, teach the women or girls any Torah or past a certain point maybe, that it was wasted on women. And Jesus said, nope, nope, they're made in my image. They're my children. They need to know. And so he taught women, and that has been the case. While there are distinctions in office and function in the church, there is no one word of the Bible that is, or one doctrine or one idea that men don't need to know or that women don't need to know. We all need the full counsel of God. There's no secret club in the church. There's no men-only room or women-only room when it comes to our growth in Christ. Next, rewards. There's no difference. Just because, and this is, I think, where things, people get in, tr uh, in trouble. They don't, don't like the idea that the Lord has men working in certain offices, serving in certain offices in the church, particularly leadership uh, roles. And, we, and I think the part of the misunderstanding is that the women will not be uh, available for a certain level of rewarding or growth before the Lord because they don't get the opportunity to serve in these offices. And that's ridiculous. 
Because the rewarding of the Lord is not based on what you did for him. The rewarding of the Lord is how he was able to uh, grow and mature you. And that doesn't, again, it doesn't matter what office you fulfill. Not one iota more uh, spiritual or more mature because someone takes on the deacon badge or the pastor badge or the elder badge doesn't make you anything before the Lord unless you're actually serving and actually conform to his character in that way. And that's what's rewardable. There will be thousands and millions of jokers who will get to the gates of heaven and stand before the beam of seed in Christ and say, I was a pastor. And he'll go, <laughs> no, you weren't. You were a television personality. Oh, I was a pastor. No, you weren't. You let, let a social club. Good job. Really, it was nice of you. But it wasn't, it wasn't the shepherding work. There'll be plenty of people who, who claim to have that. And there'll be other people who will say, well, I didn't know I was really shepherding. And you say, yeah, didn't you see, Sally, when you came along, Susie, in that time of need and counseled her and gave her the courage and encouragement and strength she needed? You were, in that sense, shepherding her. In that way, you were being the hands of Jesus in that. So, rewardability is not a distinction between men and women. There's not a, a, a higher cap for male rewardability uh, or, or female rewardability as we fulfill our various offices. And then he says, why? He says, one, you're heirs together in the grace of life. And then that is so that, like, make sure you do this. Make sure you're uh, understanding her, honoring her, and, uh, and honoring the differences between you and her so that you can have an unhindered prayer life. So that your prayers may not be hindered. Hindered here means to be cut, cut off, to be, um, you know, it interrupted, hindered, or destroyed in some way. So, or stopped in some way, rather. There's a false division in many of our minds between our spiritual life and our family life or our relationships. There is no difference. There is no distinction between your sacred life and your secular life. That is a, a sign of bad Western thinking. Who you are at work illustrates perfectly what you believe about the Lord. Now, we're all growing. That's why we're constantly growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the reality is who you are at home, the husband you are, is a direct indication of, the kind of your understanding of Jesus Christ. When a husband fails to be a Christ-like husband, his prayer life isn't worth beans. And we've got this false dichotomy that someone can somehow be an absolute spiritual success and spiritual giant, but, you know, not great kind of a failure as a family man. And I would contend to you that those people are not spiritual giants at all. They are spiritual midgets who are in the ugliest pair of platform shoes that you've ever seen. Because a true spiritual giant, though they might never take the stage, the main stage of Christian popularity and fame, a true spiritual giant is marked by his relationship to his wife or her relationship to her husband, to their relationship to their children, their family members, their neighbors. Your, whether you like it or not, your family life and your work life and whatever else it is, whatever sections you'd make for your life are a direct reflection and indication of your spiritual life. You want to grow, uh, you want to grow in Christ? Then it's going to affect your marriage period if you are growing in christ that is to say learning a lot but your marriage is not improving that is to say your and i don't mean her response that's not your responsibility but your ability to continue to love and understand and serve her if that's not growing then brother you're missing the boat and most husbands will fail as husbands because they don't know the love of christ themselves and that's what brings us to our uh, final passage. We won't be able to teach through this, of course, um, but we will get to discuss the, uh, the high points um, of Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 33. Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 33. We're going to read this whole passage for you. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, 
that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So, going very briefly through this passage, Paul sets up an analogy. You know those uh, SAT questions or whatever they are? You know, as X is to Y, so Y is to blank, right? Um, and, and so here's the analogy he's setting up. As Christ is to the church, so a husband is to the wife. Which means that your ability to be a husband is going to be based upon your understanding of Christ's love for the church. You cannot be a Christ-like husband until you have, uh, uh, unless you are growing in your understanding of the amazing and unspeakable, limitless love of Jesus Christ poured out for us at the cross. Your theology matters. Your theology is of the utmost importance. So many Christian husbands are miserable at loving their wives simply because they don't know how much Christ loves them. They don't have it to give. They don't, they're not tapped into the source. They're unable to see it. And so we look at the four loves in this passage. Four different ways that husbands, in a Christ-like way, will love their wives. First of all, sacrificial love. He gave himself up for her. For you, for most of us, that will not mean the simple task of jumping in front of a, uh, a bullet or uh, standing in front of a you know charging animal of some kind to protect her and dying to protect her. Although if it comes to that, that's absolutely your job, husbands. But it's more than that. In fact, if we just relegate it to that, most of us will probably do okay most of the time. But the reality is it is giving up your best good, your desire for her best good and her desire every single day. Asking constantly, I'm in this marriage to illustrate the love of Christ for the church. And as he set aside his uh, privileges and rights as God and came down to... Uh, take on a human body to be mocked and derided by man and rejected by those to whom he came to save, he would die to save them. He'd give up his life, being humiliated every step of the way by us, his creatures whom he loved. So, husbands, you might feel ill-used at times. Oh no, you will. Because we're selfish <laughs> and because... Sometimes we get the short end of the stick on that. You're never more like Christ when you're lovingly enduring a situation wherein someone, you're, you're suffering or struggling for the benefit or the best good of someone else. Sac sacrificial love. Next, sanctifying love. That he might sanctify and cleanse her by the washing of water by the word. The word here is not logo, is, is often used as lego. Sounds similar, but this means more the spoken word. Talk to your wives. Talk to her about spiritual things. This sanctifying love means that seeing her set apart, that you might see her set apart by what? By the way that you speak to her about spiritual things, about connecting, uh, discussing things of the Lord. So easy to just sit around and chew the fat and talk about the gossip of who said what and who did this and did you hear Sal and did you hear Bobby and can you believe the neighbors? Open up your Bible. Or better yet, have already opened up your Bible earlier that day and say, you know what I read this morning? It was the weirdest thing. Or I never noticed this. Or I just always love reading about. Start that conversation. Maybe she'll jump in and be, support, be, be ready to go. Maybe uh, there, maybe she won't. But your job is to constantly be sanctifying her, not uh, roughing her up and not teasing her and not running her down, but building her up in the Word of God. Next, caring love. Sacrificial love, sanctifying love, 
caring love. So husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, right? So this is a love that desires to see her take care of herself. Um, not all, of course, women, but as a general trend I see amongst women, an ability to run themselves into the ground. First, I got to do this. Then I got to do this. Then I got to do this. Then I got to do this. And I can't sleep till the dishes are done. I can't sleep till the, and I can't sleep till, oh my goodness. Men don't have this problem in general terms. Like, eh, I think I'll take a nap. Then I'll do the lawn. Maybe. <laughs> we have a tendency to care for our physical needs first and then, uh, you know, maybe go to the work in, in due time. And it's uh, not that one's right or one is wrong, but the reality is your wife is probably built differently uh, than you are. And that means that you might need to do the dishes. If you, you probably should do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> if your wife can't rest, can't, can't uh, calm down and rest and, and get the physical, you know, whatever she needs physically until something happens, then you need to help her make sure that happens so that she can sit down and eat with the family, so that she can uh, rest and put her feet up when she needs to, so that she's able intellectually or mentally to unwind and take a nap. You need to let her know that you are there caring for her needs and her concerns, whether that's being engaged with the children or being engaged with uh, what's going on and what stresses her out in the family or work or life situation. Sacrificial love, sanctifying love, caring love, finally bonded love. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Your husband's, your eyes need to be only for her. She is now the standard of all that is beautiful and attractive to you in your life. I'm not saying that, you know, there won't be, uh, there won't be other beautiful people in the world. Of course there are. But she is now the only place for you to experience that bonded uh, sexual love that God designed for you to enjoy. That's why extramarital sexual relationships are so destructive. It takes something that was made to be shared between one, two people and two people only, ever, completely dedicated, and it kind of spreads it out. It messes up your brain. It breaks your brain into thinking that, well, you know, I've had that sensation with these 5, 10, 15, 2, 3, whatever it is, and it makes your brain unable, or at least it makes a challenge in that dedication. And even if you've made those mistakes in the past, the dedication here of Christ-like bonded love um, is, is available as you rest in Christ. So she needs to know that you are only ever going to have eyes for her. Ever going to have eyes for her. So how can I hope to do that? Good news. You can't. It's impossible. Well, not in your flesh. The first step to being the husband God wants you to be is to make your relationship with Christ your top priority. The reason why there are so many divorces in the church is because there are a lot of Christians who are married, but very few Christian marriages. So whether husband or wife, there is no hope of being the husband or wife that God wants you to be in your marriage unless you are growing in Christ. First and foremost, drive in, lean in towards Christ, walk by faith, learn more through his word. Let his word change your view of himself and of you and everything. So in closing, what does a Christian marriage look like? It looks like a wife who's on her husband's side, supporting him to be the godliest man that he can be, the one he couldn't be if she wasn't there. A husband who's leading his wife by doing everything in his power to put her best good before his own so that she can be the godliest woman she could be, the one she couldn't be if he wasn't there, loving and serving her and leading her by loving her. And the only way this miracle will happen as if both husband and wife are connected to Christ and growing in him always. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for this impossibly high standard of what it looks to be a godly, like to be a godly husband, because it is the standard of your son, Jesus Christ, his life and his character. And oh Lord, so we recognize our great shortcoming and praise you 
that you have provided for us a way. You have provided for us this hope. You have provided for us this love. You have provided for us this life, all in the person and work of your Son, Jesus Christ. Might we ever more, with ever growing humility and love, rely upon him. And continue to grow and become those whom you designed us to be. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.